French to stay where you're at there in the Bible and just go backwards. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five to Romans chapter five. But that's to be here. Okay. Romans chapter five. What a great message about the simplicity of the gospel. I mean, it's I mean, aren't we so thankful that God made it simple? You know, that there's not many ways to get to heaven. <laughs> there's only one way. There's only one thing. We believe in Jesus, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you shall be saved. You shall be saved. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty clear. It doesn't get any more clear than that. Uh, you don't have to do ten things. You don't have to do uh, pray seven times. You don't have to climb up a stairs or whatever to get up. You don't have to... You don't pay for your own sins. That's an amazing thing, because we are not able to pay for our own sins. It's not possible, because we've already sinned. Um, you know, as what Pastor Chris said, that uh, God has already declared all uh, to be sinners. He has declared them all to be sinners. Everyone in the world, they have all sinned. They have all fallen short, all of us. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. So there's no hope, right? We might as well just end the Bible study now and just go home, right? <laughs> you know, but Jesus, though, but Jesus, but God, he paid the way for us to get to heaven. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So now we rejoice. We rejoice in that fact. And that brings us joy. That brings us peace. That brings us comfort. To know that our names are written, are written in heaven. Your name is written in heaven. Wow, that's an amazing thing, you know. So, uh, so with that being said, let's we're going to start and just kind of go through some verses here and look at some things here, uh, and then because I just came back from the pastors' conference and uh, I was going over my notes. And there were so many things loaded in there because I was going to try to go over some things with you. And I figured, I thought, you know, I think what I'm going to have to do is we're going to maybe incorporate this in um, some of the messages over the next few weeks. So that that way we all learn together because I took some really good notes, I think. Um, but there were some really great things that were said there uh, that we like to put into application for our little church here, you know. Um, you know, one of the things that Pastor Shabelli said, and I'm just, I'm kind of getting off, I'm, I'm, I said, I'm doing what I said I wasn't going to do, right? But he said to stir up, to stir up the gift of God that's in you. And the word is anazoporeo in the Greek, and it means to rekindle the fire again. That's what that word means, anazoporeo, to, to kindle the fire, to bring the fire to flames in there. Um, so to stir up the gift of God. So, uh, and he said that, you know, you think that you have a church with three people and you don't have a Sunday service He goes, you have a church, you have a church. So that brought me comfort because that was, that hit home for me right here, <laughs> you know, because, because that's what we are. And we are listed on the Greater Grace uh, World Outreach website as a church here. So we are considered to be a church here. So even though we have just a few people and uh, we don't have a Sunday morning service, but we pray. What are we going to do? We're going to pray, right? We all pray together. What if we prayed together? That was one of the other things. Uh-oh, I'm doing exactly what I said I wasn't going to do, <laughs> right? The, the first day was a day of about prayer. It was, it, was about, it was all about prayer, you know, and like Jesus, uh, um, he said that, like he said, you know, he was teaching how to pray, and he said, our Father who, uh, who, who art in heaven. Well, let's just stop right there. Let's just meditate on that and just chew on that. Our Father who art in heaven. It's like, well, and, and, and it says, and, and actually uh, to go on, it says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That, that's what I meant to say. Hallowed be thy name. Because the name, it was the name that the Jews, they wouldn't even say his name. His name was hallowed. Hallowed be thy name. You know, and what if we together as a church, we began to pray that God would add to us and that there would be a spiritual revival 
here. Do you think God would uh, answer a prayer like that? I think he would. I think he would. We have a conference coming up here, uh, November 6th, 7th, and 8th. Um, and there's about 35 to 40 people that are traveling here to, um, uh, to be here for this conference. You know, not John Dissus. There's 35 or 40 people that are going to travel here. To, and it's an amazing thing. We're going to go soul winning on Friday. We're going to go soul winning on Saturday. We're going to have um, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday morning service, which we've never had a Sunday morning service. So we're going to actually going to have one for the very first time. So I don't know that we'll continue with it. We'll see how God leads with that. Uh, but yes, that will be the goal eventually that that would happen. Okay. So with all these things being said... Um, and if you know anybody who wants to come and attend the conference and doesn't live um, here um, uh, in Clearwater, I can give you a link to the hotel. We have uh, discount prices for us, and they just click right on that link, and they just they'll be able to get their hotel room. It's it's very good, very good deal. Uh, it's ninety two dollars plus tax, and you can either get a king or two queens. So if you want to save money and room with somebody, then it's only like fifty dollars a night. You know, and you get free breakfast and you get to hang out with a bunch of hear a bunch of people, very godly people, get to meet a lot of people, get to hear some really good messages. There's going to be pastors coming from Chicago, pastors coming from Baltimore, and they're coming here to see us. Can you believe that? That's an amazing thing. They're coming here to see us. I mean, I'm blown away. I am. I'm blown away. You know, so here. So let's 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 read what it says here. It says. In verse in chapter five, verse one, it says, I'm gonna put this right here. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, what does this mean? Justification by faith. What the word justification, it means to uh, declare righteous. And just like what Pastor Chris just said a few minutes ago, that God has declared all to be sinners. God has declared everyone in the world to be sinners. But in Christ, it's, it's, it's a courtroom term. And God, in His courtroom, declares you to be righteous. Not only did He take away the penalty of our sins. You know, if, if, uh, He didn't just stop right there. Let's take away your sins. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world in John 1.29. He removed our sins as far as from the east to the, as to the west. Our sins are no more. It's like this is an amazing thing to think about. We have no sin. Even if we commit sin, and which we will because we still have an old sin nature, but we've been given a new nature, 2 Peter 1.3. Uh, we've been given a brand new nature. And, and it's the nature that comes from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gives life in John 6, 63. The Bible says that the Spirit gives life, but the flesh profits nothing. The Spirit brings life. Just like the same Holy Spirit that breathed the breath of life in, in, into Adam, and Adam became a living soul in Genesis 3, 7. That same Spirit, that same Spirit, we are regenerated by that Spirit. We are born again by the Spirit. I mean, that's amazing to think about. And the Spirit gives us life. The Spirit is the one who gives us this ability. This ability. And we are justified. We, this, is, this is our position. We have our position that's in Christ. See, there is our experience. We have our experience that we sin. We are going to sin. Uh, we read in the Bible that men of God, they were sinners. Their sins are recorded in the Bible. That didn't disqualify them to go to heaven, did it? Like Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness in Genesis 15, 6. That's why Abraham's going to heaven, because he believed God. Just like what Pastor Chris said, that to mix faith with the word of God, not to have knowledge only, but to mix faith with the word of God in Hebrews 4, 2. To mix faith. Faith is the key ingredient, to believe Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe and you will go to heaven. You believe on him, not just believe in him that he's real, but you trust him as your personal savior. 
And you are justified, you are declared righteous by God in the courtroom of God. This is an amazing thing to grab a hold of. Justified. So we are justified by faith. And what is it? It says we have peace with God. This is not the peace in the heart that, you know, where it says like Isaiah 26.3 says, Perfect peace has he whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in thee. There is peace in the heart. This means that peace with God as far as that there is no, we are no longer, uh, no longer enemies with God. We were once the enemies of God in Ephesians chapter 2. But you are no longer the enemy of God. You are God's child. Wow. You are the child of God. He loves you. He calls you his own. You are the child of God. Uh, we are, and so we have peace with God through what? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where there is no other way. There is no other name. There is no other way to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. In John 14, 6. What a bold statement. There's people who don't like it that he said that. They say that, you know, the Bible can't be real because they're saying that you're, you're, be, you're, being, very, you're being very, uh, very um, exclusive. I heard somebody told me that. I told them, I said, you know, you have to believe in Jesus. You have to receive Jesus as your Savior. He says, well, you're being, very, you're being very exclusive, aren't you? Yep, I am. That's what Jesus said. He said, I'm the only way. He said, I am the door. He said, no man comes into the sheepfold except through me, through the door. No man gets to the Father except through me. Wow. There must be, you know, either he was a liar or he was, he was a, uh, this uh, lunatic person running around saying, I am the only way to get to heaven, or it's the truth. There's only three choices there. There's only three ways. There's only three one. Three. Liar, lunatic, or Lord, right? <laughs> so it says in verse 2, it says, By whom we have access, access by faith into this grace. In other words, it goes back to what we were just saying, that we have access what by faith into this grace. There is, it's the way in. It's the entrance way in. It's the way that we can enter in. Uh, it says we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in grace. Wow, we are saved by grace, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Um, and we stand in grace. In other words, like you can't get out of it anymore. You can't get out of grace. You stand in it. Um, and, and what is grace anyway? What is grace? What, when we say grace, like what does that mean? There are some people think, well, grace means it's something I say whenever I, uh, whenever I um, um, eat my dinner. You know, we say grace. You know, some people, they, you know, and that may be true, but grace means God's unmerited favor that's freely bestowed to us, that is given to us, not based upon our works, but based upon the love of God and who God is. God is love, 1 John 4, 8. So his giving me grace has nothing to do. I didn't earn it. It's not merited. And it can't even be returned. But what he expects is that his grace will yield him, will yield him a return. Because the Bible says we are taught by grace in Titus 2.11. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Wow. That, that grace teaches us. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance in Romans 2.4. Not the Ten Commandments. The Bible tells very clearly the purpose of the Ten Commandments. It was, to, it was to, that every mouth would be stopped and the whole world would become guilty before God, Romans 3.19 and 20. It says, no one is justified in his sight by the deeds of the law, for by the law is a knowledge of sin. I mean, that's pretty clear in the Bible, isn't it? That the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be what? Justified by faith in Galatians 3.24. It was my teacher. It taught me that I was a sinner because otherwise, how would I know what sin was? That's what Paul said. How would I know what sin was except what the Bible says? How would I know that? Because the, the, the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not covet. How else would I know? Unless it says thou shalt not covet. That's what sin is. But Jesus came and he never sinned and he fulfilled the law in every point. God's requirement. 
fulfill the law in every point. Because the Bible tells us in James, in the book of James 2.10, I think it is, says if we break the law in one point, we broke the whole law. You've offended the whole law as far as God is concerned. So that makes everyone disqualified in the world, doesn't it? I broke the law, disqualified, can't go to heaven. Except Jesus, though, he never, he fulfilled all the law in our, st- in our, st- our stead. The Father required it. Um, so, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, I want you to keep that in your mind there. Hope of the glory of God. Think about it. We're going to talk about it here in just a minute. Hope of the glory of God. Okay? Uh, it says, and not only so, verse 3, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience. In patience, experience, and experience hope. So here's the progression, right? Here's the progression. It says, we glory in tribulations. And so, in other words, what? You mean that's not very natural, is it? To glory in tribulations? That's not a natural thing to do. To glory in tribulations. You know, it's like, like the, the whole world's falling apart around you and you're like, you're glorying in it? Because why? Because it works patience. The Greek word is... Uh, hupemoni, or hupemoni, H-U-P-E-M-O-N-E. That's probably not right. That's okay. Look it up in the strong concordance. So hupemoni, I'm not even saying it right. So, but it means to remain under, to remain under, to stay in it. It it teaches me to relax in in the tribulation. I'm not trying to get out of it. I'm just trusting God for the situation, for the time the things that are going on in my life. And there's nobody that doesn't have trials. You know, there was something that was said at the pastor's conference that, uh, well, you know, if I'm not saved, then I don't have as much trouble in life. But I get saved, I get more trouble. It's like, no, I want to, I want to be unsaved, right? No, but, but because you enter into warfare as being a Christian. Satan comes against you. He doesn't mess around with people that are not following the Lord. They're, he's right where they want them to be at. You know, we, they're eating, uh, uh, eating potato chips and watching uh, shows at night, you know. And what does God do? God calls us out of that into a much bigger thing. This is what Pastor Schaller brought out in one of his messages, I think Wednesday night message, if you saw that. Like, you know, I could be eating potato chips uh, and watching uh, Gunsmoke, which is something that we do, you know, to be honest with you. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it's a very good show. Uh, but... Uh, But, you know, but God says, I have much more than that for you. I have much more than that for you. I have, I I have a high, holy and uh, heavenly calling for your life. You know, this is an amazing thing. So it says, we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience and patience experience. Okay. Uh, The word is doke me. Um, And it means, uh, it means approval and, a, and a experience hope. And it, listen to this, verse 5. This is where we want to be at. And hope makes not ashamed. Remember what we said before? We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Hope makes us not ashamed. Hope makes us not ashamed. What happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Their eyes were opened, and they realized that they were were naked and they sewed for themselves fig leaves it says in the bible to cover themselves up and they were uh they had fear shame and guilt entered in it never entered into them before they had never experienced this before fear guilt and shame and so the love of god in first john 4 18 it cast out fear it takes care of fear and the blood of christ takes care of the guilt of our sins. And the shame is what does it say here? That the that the love of God, hope makes us not ashamed. Hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which He has given to us. What is hope? The Greek word the Greek word is the Greek word is elpis, E-L-P-I-S, E-L-P-I-S. And it means it means confident expectation. Confident expectations kind of change the, 
the meaning over the years? Because now hope, we think of hope as like, well, I hope I get that raise at work. I hope I get uh, that promotion. I hope that I get my uh, mortgage paid off before I'm a certain age. And I hope I can retire at a certain age. And it really is like a shed of doubt in a way. But this is hope is confident expectation. You know, Colossians 127 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Uh, 1 John 3, 2 says that, that, that we look, we have an expectation for Jesus, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is impure. As he is, it says, it says we, we know that, that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. So God says we're pure. We're pure. We have no sin. But we become purified, you know, in our thinking because now we, are, we, 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 it's, we have this confident expectation. It's an amazing thing to think about. And we are not ashamed. We are not ashamed because we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We reckon ourselves to be righteous. We can walk with our head up, believing I am righteous, not, not, not a self-righteousness, because self-righteousness means I'm righteous because I do righteous things. It's not a self-righteousness, which is a false righteousness. I hold my head up because I am righteous because of Christ. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 he became sin, who knew no sin. He never knew sin. Adam and Eve knew sin. Um, and so, and we knew sin. Okay, and it says, And hope makes us not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Now, the King James says Holy Ghost. The Greek word is pneuma. And uh, we've been taught long ago from Pastor Stevens that, you know, God is not a ghost. You know, and it's it's an old English word that was used. It's like like the King James was written in 1611 and they spoke differently back then. They called a spirit a ghost, a, you know. And so now we think of ghosts. We think of someone uh, like um, Casper. Yeah, thank you. Casper. Casper is a ghost. Very good. You were you. Did you hear that somewhere? Yeah. Casper is a ghost. Right. And so we think of that. He's God is not a ghost. God is a spirit. You know, God is a spirit in John 4, 24. And actually it says there that God is spirit. God is spirit. You know, and that those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit. So um, it says, and so that's a little sidetrack there. Um, it says, hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. The Holy Spirit has been given unto you. Do you know that you have God in you? You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That, that is an amazing thing to think about. God in you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, as we just quoted a minute ago. Um, and so in verse 6, it says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Who did he die for? The ungodly. He died for the ungodly. Let's read on. It says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. Now, this is like the King James wording here. But, you know, what it, what it means is, is that, um, that perhaps that, that it, is, uh, it is not easy for someone to die for a righteous man or for someone, but, but yet one will die. It says yet, but, but maybe perhaps per eventual means perhaps for a good man, one would even dare to die. You know, the Bible, Jesus said, there's no greater love has any man than this, that a man lays down his life for his friends. That's the greatest that a man could love. I mean, we've seen it before happen. Like people will die for their friends because, because there is, there is phileo love, which is a uh, brotherly type of love, and it's a good. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's 
it's actually a very good love. It's a brotherly love. Uh, there's, there's eros, which is a, um, um, a sexual type of love. And then there's agape. There's the agape love of God, which is much higher than phileo love. It's higher than any of these others love because it's not based upon uh, mutual interest. Like phileo is based upon mutual interest. You know, if we like to go skiing together or boating together or biking together, and we have certain common interests. We are friends because of that. That's what phileo love is. But agape love says, I love my enemies. That's not natural. That's not a natural. You know, Luke 6.35 says, to pray for those who despitefully use you. You know, to, do, to turn the other cheek. That's not a natural thing to do, but that's what Jesus did. When he was on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's like, wow. Jesus, the greatest example of all, who demonstrated the love of God. It says that he commended his love toward us. It means that he demonstrated it toward us in that while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to repent. He didn't wait for us to do five, five um, Hail Marys or whatever it is, right? I was, never, I was never Catholic. You know, he didn't wait for us to be baptized. He didn't wait for us to come to church. He didn't wait for us to start reading our Bible. He didn't wait for us to start praying. He says, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I came not for the righteous, but I came for sinners. I came to seek and save that which was lost. That's what Jesus said. He didn't come to talk about politics. He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came for sinners. That was his purpose, to come to a cross and die on the cross. It was prophesied in the Old Testament in Psalm 22. It was prophesied in Isaiah 53. I mean, read those sometimes. It's, it's an amazing how, how clear and precise it is about what, what happened to Jesus on the cross. That's why he came. The Jews think that he came to liberate them from, that's what they're expecting, that he's going to come and liberate them from bondage from Rome or from uh, uh, the government or whatever. That's, but no, he came to die to pay for our sins. He came to liberate us from sin. Not only from the power of sin, I'm not only from the penalty of sin, rather, but from the power of sin, too. Wow. And he has given us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He points to Christ. He points to the life of Christ. He magnifies the Word. He makes it come alive, the Bible, so that we can understand it. And if you seek for truth, you will find it. Wow. So... Um, now, in, okay, so in verse 8, it says, But God committeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than, much more than. I mean, this is a word that we see a lot here in Romans, much more, much more. Because Jesus' blood, and we see the, the word in the book of Hebrews, uh, the, the, the word better appears over and over and over again. Jesus his sacrifice was better than the sacrifice of uh, bulls and goats. It was a better sacrifice. It was a complete sacrifice. And there was much more. There was much more. It was it, it, it like, because why? Because people, they might die for a good man, for a righteous man. They would struggle to do it. But God gladly, it says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despised the shame and was set down at the right hand of the throne of God in Romans or in uh, uh, Hebrews 12 too. Not that going to the cross was joy for him, but, the, but what would result from it? He didn't hesitate. He didn't one time think, no, I'm not going to go do that. I'm not going to go pay for their sins. Wow, that's the much more. That's the much more. Um, and so it says much more now than it says being now justified by his what? His blood. Now, we were it says in verse 5, verse 1, it says we're justified by faith. By faith. But it's faith in the blood. We are justified by the blood. His blood. The life of the animal is in the blood. The life is in the blood. You take the blood out, there's no more life. And so we are justified by His blood. It was, it was His blood that God required. We are justified. 
Um, we are declared righteous, much more than justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. Saved from wrath. If, for if, in verse 10, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So we were the enemies of God, and we were reconciled. Now, what's the word reconcile, re- reconciled? It's katalasso in the Greek, katalasso. And it means to change. Not that God changed or lowered his level down, his requirements, his righteous requirements down. God himself didn't change, but he changed us. He made us righteous. He made us complete in him. He made us the head and not the tail, as it says in in the Bible. We are complete in Christ, Colossians 2.10. Like, He changed us. He reconciled us to Him and made us acceptable to Him whenever we were not acceptable. This was the justice and the love of God that was met at the cross. In other words, like, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There it is right there, John 3.16, that His justice and His love were met at the cross. In other words, like he loved us, but he couldn't allow us to go to heaven because we had sinned. So, but his justice was required. And there's where Jesus came to die, to pay for our sins so that his justice would be met and his love would be met at the same time. See, that's called the finished work. That's called the good news. Um, And it says that much more being reconciled, we shall be saved. By his life. In verse 11, it says, Not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have now received the atonement, is what it says in King James. But it's, it's really the same word, reconciliation. It the, it's, has the definite article in front of it, which means that it puts, it puts a, it defines that there is something that is the reconciliation. It exists. It's real. There is a reconciliation. There is a way to be reconciled to God. There is a way to be able to come back to God, and it's through the blood of Christ. I mean, this is called the good news. We call it the finished work. It's a term that's been, that's been thrown around for years and years and years here. And we get it from John 19.30, where Jesus said, It is finished. It is finished. It's in the perfect tense. It's in the perfect tense, which means action that took place in the past that has continuing results. Or you can say it's a present tense that was based upon something that happened in the past. It continues on. It's a continuous, like like if I was to say I shut the door, which is something I did earlier, I shut the door. Well, it's still shut. It's still shut. So it is finished, Jesus said. It is still is finished. It is finished. There is nothing to be added to. There is nothing to be added to our salvation. We don't add to what Jesus did. It's not Jesus plus be good. It's not Jesus plus follow the Ten Commandments. It's Jesus plus nothing. You know, if we add anything to it, it's faith. It's believing what Jesus has done. It's believing the Word of God. It's believing. Just like what Pastor Chris said, it is so important. And, and faith works by love in Galatians 5, 6. We understand and we believe because God loves us. He loved us. Amen? Amen. So we, we did a prayer of salvation before, but uh, we can do it again because we, we want to drive it home. There may, there's people out there, I think, that are listening to us who have never received Jesus before as their Savior. And they want to go to heaven. They want to become born again. They, because there is no other way to go to heaven. And so it's a simple prayer of faith. It's a prayer of asking Him. What if you asked Him? What if you asked Him to save you? Would He do it? He would. God loves you. He wants you to ask Him. He wants you to ask Him. So just simply pray. Just simply believe and pray. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm not good enough to go to heaven because I've sinned. But you died for me. 
you paid the penalty of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. I want to go to heaven when I die. Save me, Jesus, by your blood. Thank you for paying my way to get to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've said that prayer, all the angels in heaven are rejoicing over one sinner that turns to repentance, but repentance means to change your mind, metanoia. You change your belief system. You believe that going to heaven was by being good. You believe that going to heaven was by following the Ten Commandments. By, uh, and now you've changed your belief system. Now you believe that I'm going to heaven because of Jesus. And if somebody was to ask you, like, why are you going to heaven? Your response would be that I'm going to heaven because Jesus paid my way to go to heaven. He paid the penalty of all my sins, and I accepted him as my Savior. And once you've accepted him as your Savior, it's a one-time thing. It's not a progress. You do it one time. And you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until when? The day of redemption. The day of redemption. That means when you go home to be with Jesus, you are sealed. And you, are gonna, you, you have a place in heaven. Jesus said, I go away and I prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you, just in case you have any kind of doubts at all. I go and I prepare a place for you. Just in, just in case you doubt it for any reason, I would have told you there is a place for you in heaven. So amen. So if you've said that prayer, uh, please shoot me a, um, an instant message if you want to on Facebook, or you can feel free to give me a call at 727 727- 452-7445 at 727-452-7445. And be sure to check us out. We have a website. It's www.greatergrace.church. Just think, just remember that, greatergrace.church. Very, very easy. I was thankful to God whenever I saw that that, that, that address was available, greatergrace.church. It's like, what? Nobody got this yet? It's like, okay, great. You know? So amen.